and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is dedicated to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Rommel Gassain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International. Welcome to the show, Doctor. It's a real pleasure to have you come and share some of your insights with us. Thank you very much, Rommel. It's great to be here. First of all, I would like to um, start off by telling our viewers that what Dr. Mark will be talking to us about will be science and the Bible. So if I can just turn back to you, Mark, and if you can just talk to us about, first of all, the, the book of Je Genesis or the, the origins of, of the universe. Now, a lot of people, when they approach the Bible, especially the book of Genesis, they have varied views, different uh, ways of interpreting the Bible. Now, what does the author um, teach us particularly in this book? Well, the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. So it tells us what happened right at the very beginning. Now we talked about in one of our previous sessions about how the Bible is in fact the correct holy book. It's God is the ultimate author through his Holy Spirit working through the human writers who, who wrote the actual words that we read today in the mm -hmm. original languages. So the challenge is often made because the book of Genesis was originally written in Hebrew, how can we be sure that what we're reading today is correct and how can we be sure that we are interpreting it correctly? Yes. And so I thought it would be helpful if we looked at some basic principles, I guess, of how to interpret the Bible, how to make sense of what we read. Mm -hmm. And I guess the first thing to say is that because the Bible is God's word, then we should always make sure that we interpret the Bible with other parts of the Bible. In other words, we don't take this book and say that um, man's opinions actually override it or mm. are more important than it. So we don't use man's opinions to interpret the Bible. Mm -hmm. We in fact start with the Bible and use that to base our opinions on. Mm. It's got to be an authority base. Absolutely, you know, yeah. absolutely. Okay. And if it is indeed God's word, which we believe it is, then you would expect it to be an authoritative book. Mm -hmm. So that's the first principle. Always use the Bible scriptures to interpret scriptures. I think the second script, uh, principle in interpreting scripture is to recognise that this is God's message to mankind and he has provided us this message in a form that is readily understood. So God's trying to communicate with us. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So and he, this is the means that he's chosen. That's right, uh -huh. that's right, through this book. And because of that, you would have to expect, therefore, that the Bible was written to be understood. So it's not written in some kind of um, obscure code that perhaps only people with PhDs in theology or something would be able to understand. So that's the second important principle. Um, the third principle, which is very important, is that because God is all-powerful and he's all-knowing, then it makes no sense that he would want to deceive us. Mm. Uh, and of course, he loves us. And the whole of the Bible is a story of God's love for mankind, how he reaches out to be in relationship with mankind. So there are three ways then that we need, or three principles to keep so, in mind. So, sorry, on that last point, so sure. there's nothing more that God would want for his creation than for them to be able to understand his purpose or his message for them. That's exactly right, uh -huh. exactly right. So the first principle is we should interpret the Bible, Scripture, with Scripture. Mm -hmm. The second principle is that the Bible is written to be understood. So when it plainly says something, we should be able to straightforwardly believe it. And uh, the third principle is that God would not deceive us. So if he plainly says something, then we can accept it as being the truth. Mm -hmm. I once heard uh, an old saying that went like this. It said, if the plain sense makes sense, then we should seek no other sense, lest it be nonsense. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> so given those fundamental principles, and perhaps I could add a fourth one, because this book is in fact God's word and because we're talking about spiritual things, uh -huh. then we, it's always good to invite God's Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to us as we read his book. Mm -hmm. Because as we do that, then we can understand not only with our heads, but also from our hearts, what God is seeking to impart to us. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we've taken these principles and we're ready to apply them. What's the picture that emerges? 
Well, the Bible begins by telling us in the very first chapter of Genesis that God created everything in the heavens and in the earth in six ordinary days. Six literal days. Six literal days, just wow. like you and I experience today. Uh -huh. And we know that because there is a number next to each of the days in Genesis chapter 1. And you can test this in any language you like. If you place a number next to the word day, it always means a 24-hour day. Mm. Now, day can mean different things, like I could say to you, um, in my father's day, mm. meaning some indefinite period of time in the past. It doesn't mean my father lived for just one day, yeah. of course, because yeah. otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, but the context always makes clear what the meaning is. And if you put a number next to the word day, then it always means a 24-hour day. It's specific. Quite yes. specific, uh -huh. yes. And also in Genesis chapter 1, God describes a period of activity and then he says there was evening and then there was morning. So he actually defines what a day is and mm. then puts a number next to it. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt of what the text is actually trying to tell us. So that's the first thing I think we notice it's very in plain. Genesis 1. Yeah. Yeah, very, a very clear statement that uh, it all took place in just six ordinary days. Mm -hmm. Seems quite amazing. You know, someone once said to me, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, just like the Bible says, then um, he could have created the universe in six microseconds. That's true. Why no, that did true. he take so long? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good question, isn't it? That is, yeah. But the reason God took so long is because he laid down a pattern for us. Uh -huh. And in fact, we read about that in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, where it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, mm. but he rested on the seventh day. Mm. So God laid down a pattern for our benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, but if you tried to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, I mean, you can't do it, can <laughs> no. you? We just burn out. exhausted, yeah. We need to be able to have a period of rest. So that's why God took as long as he did. Okay. And then the next thing we read in the opening chapters of Genesis is that man chose to rebel against his creator. And that was a tragic thing. But that act of rebellion ushered in suffering and death and all the bad stuff that we see in the world today. Like as a consequence? As a consequence, that's okay. right. I, I think of it like this. Man chose to cut himself off from the source of all life. Mm. And if you think about it, the only possible result that can come from that is death. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Now, he didn't die instantly, of course. So specifically here, we're talking about the original, our original parents, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, okay. that's right. That's right. Uh -huh. Their act of rebellion against God separated them from God. They were separated spiritually immediately and it set in motion these inevitable processes of decay and then finally physical death. Mm. So that's the next important thing that we read in the opening chapters of Genesis. Now we know that before Adam's rebellion, the world was perfect because God had declared it to be. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, wow, he that's... said it is very good or perfect. Mm. And that's really hard to imagine. Isn't really? it? It's it, hard for it, us to imagine, yeah. yes. Wow. Because we live in this world which is uh, what you could call a fallen world yeah. or a broken world. It's not the original exactly. perfect world that I God mean, I'm, made. I'm just mentioning that just as a passing comment because God created it to be perfect. That, That's that right. Was his, yeah. That's right. In uh -huh. fact, everything God does is perfect. Mm. He's, he's not disorganised or unable to make something properly. Mm -hmm. um, he made the original creation perfect. Mm -hmm. And then as we go on, we read that great wickedness spread out over the face of the earth, so much so that God resolved that he would judge the face of the earth with a global catastrophic flood that would cover the entire earth. Mm -hmm. And we read of how Noah built an ark and God brought two of every kind of animal, seven of some, to Noah. They all went on board the ark. And then the floodwaters came and wiped out all of the uh, land-dwelling and uh, air-breathing creatures that were on the face of the earth. Only those with Noah on board the ark survived. Mm -hmm. And that was a global catastrophic event. And we see evidence for that in the world around us today. And, and in some later sessions, we'll talk about those evidences. And after that, we read that uh, in Genesis chapter 11, 
uh, there's this amazing story of how God came and confused the languages of the people. Mm. You see, up until that time, there'd only ever been one language spoken on the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Adam and Eve would have had a language That's and they right. taught their children who taught their children who taught their children um, and so on. And man, however, was still rebellious at heart, even after the flood. And God had told them to spread out over the face of the earth. But they all gathered together in one place <laughs> on a plain called Shinar, it says in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And there they built a great city that was going to have a huge tower yeah. And they're going to make a name for themselves. So Mm -hmm. God came down and confused the languages of the people. Now, that is the origin of all the different language groups we have today, all the different ethnic groups and so on, because the people then spread out. They scattered away from Babel as soon as God had confused the languages. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing thing. What you're doing here is you're showing that through the book of Genesis, we're able to understand all these things, rebellion, death, sin, languages. You're even able to explain to us some of the consequences of the judgments of God in terms of you know, uh, Noah's Ark and, and the global flood that occurred there. So we, we ought to, as we read the book of Genesis, when we read these stories, they're not figurative, but they're quite literal. We should take them as, as they are, That's as a right. narrative, That's you're right. saying. So using those principles that we talked about before, uh-huh. uh, for instance, the six days of creation, we see that in Genesis chapter 1. Is there any other part of the Bible that confirms that? And I mentioned Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, where actually it was the finger of God writing on tablets of stone hmm. said, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. So we find that Scripture interprets and supports scripture mm-hmm. and that was one of that was the first principle remember we talked about mm-hmm. so we get a very clear message out of the bible in the opening 11 chapters of the sequence of events which is why the world is the way it is today mm-hmm. and so when we take these things uh, you, you know, when we look at the Bible, it's, it's split into two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is there any support of those things that you're explaining in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, in the New Testament? Can we find it? Did Jesus, for instance, agree with these things? Well, in fact, he did. Um, and let me give you an example. Jesus was challenged by some lawyers uh, about the question of marriage. And uh, he replied to them, and you, we can find this Um, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 19. And uh, he said this, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and Mm. the two will become one flesh. So what Jesus was doing was quoting from Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, actually, in giving that answer about the purpose of the creation Mm. of mankind as male and female. See, God created us male and female so that marriage would be possible. Mm. But notice what he says at the beginning. He said, the the commencement of that quotation, that at the beginning, he says, the creator made them male and female. Now, if the Bible's account of history is true, we read on the sixth day of creation, God made Adam and Eve. So from Jesus' standpoint, 4,000 years earlier, according to Bible timelines, would have been when the creation took place. Mm -hmm. And on the sixth day of the first week, Adam and Eve are made. Now that sounds just like at the beginning of creation, doesn't it? That's right, yes. But if, as some people would believe, the universe is 15 billion years old and mankind has only appeared just in the last sort of million or so years, then that's not the beginning of creation, is it? No. That's at the end of the creation. So the way Jesus ex- expresses himself here shows that he clearly took the timelines that we see in Genesis chapter 1 mm-hmm. as being literally true, perfectly mm. straightforward. That's a good example. In fact, if I could just um, perhaps mention that, if we look at the, the dates that we find in the book of Genesis for certain events, for instance, we read that Um, In the first year, the creation week took place right at the beginning. We then read that um, 1,656 years after the creation, the flood took place. Mm -hmm. And we can find from the scriptures that 2,008 years after the creation, Abraham was born. Mm 
So that gives us a timeline from the creation to the time of Abraham, about 2,000 years, from Abraham to the time of Jesus was also about 2,000 years, and from the time of Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. So what's all that? So here we are, about <laughs> 6,000 years from the time of the creation. That's not, a lot not shorter, yeah. Then. So I was just That's about right. to say, it's a lot shorter than what we're being taught and what we're being told. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. So the question is, which is right? Is what the Bible says correct about its history of the past, or is it man's opinions about what has happened in the past that, that is correct? Mm -hmm. But it's not just um, uh, those, that particular instance where Jesus was challenged about marriage. Uh, there was another case uh, where he is uh, talking to, um, the, to the Pharisees and he refers to the blood of righteous Abel. 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 Now, Abel was the son of Adam and Eve. Okay. And their other son, Cain, in fact, murdered Abel. That's right, yes. The first recorded murder in the Bible. Mm. So Jesus is referring to Adam and Eve's son as though he was a real person. Mm -hmm. So Jesus once again believes without hesitation That's right. that the people that we read about in the book of Genesis were actual people, it's, real people. It's not just a story to point to a moral. No, that's right. Uh -huh. these, these people are not, um, are not symbolic somehow. They're yes. not, um, not mythological people. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, uh, if we look in Luke chapter 3, there is uh, a genealogy traced all the way from Jesus right the way back to Adam, wow. and it says the Son of God. Mm. So there's an unbroken line going from Jesus back to Adam. Now, the people in there are real people because it refers to uh, people like David, King David, and then from David back to Abraham. He's mentioned in that lineage. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, before Abraham, rather, we go back and go back. So if the stories in the early chapters of Genesis were just mythical, at what stage does a real person transform into a myth <laughs> and yet produce a real human offspring. They would have thrown it out anyway. Yeah, I, don't, exactly. I don't think those writers would have gone anywhere had they been. I mean, if it was just made up names, people would have said, hey, what are you talking about? That's, That's right. true. That's yeah. right. So there's no doubt that Jesus definitely believed that um, the account that we read in Genesis was actually true. Mm -hmm. You know, there was um, an interesting question put to a Hebrew scholar, uh, a gentleman called Professor James Barr. And Professor Barr was um, Professor of Hebrew at Oxford University, which is a very prestigious um, so he, university. He, he was a Christian, is he? No, no, he's not a Christian, interestingly enough. Okay. Um, which, in a sense, makes him like a hostile witness. Mm. So he doesn't necessarily believe that the Bible is God's word. But he was asked the question, what does Genesis mean? And I think this is an important quotation. I'd like to read it to you because it's very significant. Okay. He said this, probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 to 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same days of 24 hours we now experience. The figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition, a chronology from the beginning of the world up to the later stages of the biblical story. And thirdly, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguish all human and animal life except for those in the ark. Wow. Now that's an interesting quotation because here we have an expert in Hebrew saying that the text of this book is absolutely plain in its meaning. Mm. So it's not that the Bible is difficult to understand, it's actually difficult to believe. Mm. So is there anyone else? I mean, other than the Lord Jesus, is there a, maybe perhaps a, a major disciple, someone else who also used the original accounts, the account of Genesis, to, to prove what he's saying? Absolutely. In fact, when we look at uh, the writings in particular of Paul, um, Paul makes the point in uh, Corinthians he, he, in fact, describes the whole plan that God has of redemption in terms of the first Adam, meaning the real physical man, uh, uh, the original uh, man, Adam, and, of course, his wife, Eve, that their rebellion uh, 
brought death and suffering into the world. So mm -hmm. he refers to them as the first Adam. And then he talks about Jesus as being the last Adam. Mm. And we read this uh, in 1 Corinthians, um, and it says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Mm. So the whole of Paul's doctrine of redemption is actually grounded very firmly in the literal, historical truth of the book of Genesis. That, that's important because they all point back to a central point. So they're not going further back or some book that you know, we don't know where it is or what information it contains, but they're all going back to that uh, same source, if that's you right. like. Yeah. That's right. In fact, it makes us understand how precious and how valuable the Word of God is. Mm. Because if you think about it, we would have absolutely no way of knowing what happened right back at the beginning unless God had laid it out for us. Mm. And he, unless he had laid it out in such a way that was straightforward and simple for us to understand. Mm -hmm. okay. So many people will say, yes, but you know, that's just your way of interpreting the opening chapters of Genesis. But if we come back to those principles that I mentioned at the beginning of of interpreting the scriptures, we find that it's, uh, it's consistent with what the Bible says right throughout. Jesus believed the opening chapters of Genesis were just what they say. The Apostle Paul's whole doctrine of mm -hmm. uh, redemption was based on it. Mm. And in fact, there's a couple of other interesting ones. Let me just um, mention them. There was another occasion when Jesus was making reference to those opening chapters in Genesis. And on this occasion, he was talking about his second coming, how he's going to come back again in glory this time. Mm -hmm. And he described it like this, and we read it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. He says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, if the story of Noah wasn't real, if the flood wasn't a real event, if there's no such thing as, as Noah's ark and and the, the, the judgment that God brought on the world in those days. How can we be sure then that Jesus really is going to come again? That's right. Because if one is a myth, then... Why should you believe the other? Yes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so I think that's a very, very important point because in all of the major Christian creeds, a central point is the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only when he comes again... He will not come as the suffering Messiah. He will come as a ruler and judge and he will bring about the end of the age. Mm -hmm. So it will be a triumphal return when he comes. But if it's like it was in the days of Noah and they didn't ever happen, how can we ever be sure that such a thing will in fact really mm. occur? So if, I'm, if I read the Old Testament in particular, the book of Genesis, uh, you know, in that manner, uh, I take those principles as you mentioned them, and I look at it and I say, okay, fair enough. These things happened. They existed. Your, in, your manner of interpretation makes sense. That, that's, that's all well and good. But really, how does that affect me? I mean, at the end of the day, who cares? Well, that's a, a question that a lot of people ask. And that gets right to the nub of the issue, of course. Who cares? Well, you know, because we were made, as the Bible tells us, in God's image, we have an eternal spirit and soul. And that means that when our bodies die, which they all will do at some stage or other, then we have an eternal life going forward. Mm -hmm. And how we spend our eternity hinges on how we respond to that question that you asked. Mm. Do we believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, that he was there with God right at the beginning, partaking, participating in the creation, mm -hmm. that he gave his life for us, that he paid the price for our sin. Because when we by faith believe that, the Bible says we can experience the new birth and we become born again. And this is the amazing thing. God places his own Holy Spirit into the heart of every single believer. Wow. And that guarantees our inheritance for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that question is a fundamental question and fundamentally important to every single person. Mm. So it is important and it directly affects and it relates to me. That's right. Uh -huh. It does indeed. So those opening chapters of Genesis, uh, 
and the history that they record lay the very foundations for the whole of the gospel message. Okay, unfortunately we've run out of time, but thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harwood. You're welcome. Yeah, for sharing some of your Thank insights you. and your knowledge with us. It's always a pleasure to have you. If I could just uh, wrap things up and turn to our viewers. If you need information, we'll have a website which will pop up on the screen. Please look into these things, check them out. And also, if I can say, please stay in tune for the next episode. And may the Lord bless you. See you. <laughs>